Show. It's Stephen Rose. Stephen Rose. Stephen Rose. Stephen Rose. Bringing you entertaining and inspiring guests. Thank you for joining me for another amazing episode of the world-famous and award-winning Stephen Rowan podcast show. This week's guest is cyclist, ocean roar, mountaineer, broadcaster and author Mr Mark Beaumont. He joins us ahead of his 18,000 mile world record circumnavigation, an amazing feat that he hopes to accomplish in 80 days. I'm delighted to have Mark on the show. My first experience of Mark was back in 2008, watching the BBC documentary the Man Who Cycled World. If you've not seen it yet, you should watch it. The programme captures the spirit of adventures it's seen through Mark's eyes. It's brutally honest and shows us not only how rewarding a challenge of this magnitude can be, but also the mindset required to complete it. After watching it, I'm sure you will have a thirst for adventure and perhaps wonder what you can achieve when you focus on a task. Since then, he's been incredibly busy on and off the saddle. In 2010, he sailed from Anchorage, Alaska, USA, to Ushuaia in southern Argentina. In addition to cycling the 13,080 miles in 268 days, he also climbed the highest peaks in North and South America, McKinley and Nkoga. During the summer of 2011, he swapped a bike for a boat and joined the team of six in rowing through the Canadian Arctic. They missed to reach a 1996 location of the North Magnetic Pole. In early 2012, he joined the team in an attempt to break the world record for rowing across the Atlantic Ocean. After 27 days and over 2,000 miles into the expedition, they capsized and had to be rescued. In May 2015, he set a new record in his Africa Solo Challenge, cycling from Cairo to Cape Town in 42 days, beating the previous record by 17 days. In 2015, he set the record for completing the North Coast 500, a 518.7 mile route around Scotland, by bicycle in 37 hours, 56 minutes and 44 seconds. If you want to find out more about Mark, then check out the Man Who Cycled the World BBC documentary and the Man Who Cycled America's documentary. And in addition to his BAFTA-nominated documentarian work, he has also written The Man Who Cycled the World, his first and best-selling book, and The Man Who Cycled America's. What a list of achievements, but I'm not done yet. He has a degree in politics and is also the rector of Dundee University, but perhaps most importantly, he's married with two children. As with many high achievers, Mark is devoid of ego and is grateful for those around him. So stay tuned and find out how Mark lives his incredible life. During the show, we discuss how he develops his focus and self-belief, his ability to cope in challenging situations, the difference between type two and type one fun, his love of pushing himself, the ability to find fun and stress, his reasons for repeating the ultra-endurance circumnavigation, his strategy and daily schedule for beating the circumnavigation record, and his strategy for making difficult and stressful decisions. If you want to know more about Mark and his adventures, check out markbeaumontonline.com. And if you enjoyed this episode, check out the one with Levin Brown. All episodes can be found at www.stephenroundshow.com. As always, please take the time to share, retweet and review. But for now, let's get it on like Donkey Kong. It's the Stephen Rowan Show. It's Stephen Rowan. Stephen Rowan. Stephen Rowan. Stephen Rowan. Bringing you entertaining and inspiring guests. Okay, so Mark Bowman, welcome to the show. Quite an amazing story. Homeschooled on a farm. You've ended up cycling the world. You've had adventures all around the planet. You must have had an amazing amount of freedom growing up on the farm. How did that affect you growing up? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess it did. I mean, when you're a child, you don't question it. But, I mean, being homeschooled certainly meant I was in the outdoors most of the time. I spent a couple hours a day at most around the kitchen table doing my subjects, and the rest of the time I was working on the farm. Um, so in the late 80s, early 90s, my parents got into organics, which was probably um, a good time before it was, uh, you know, fashionable and probably profitable. Uh, so it was a swallows and Amazon's existence because I was uh, out on the farm every morning um, helping milk 60 goats and uh, collecting eggs from 200 hens and uh, mucking out the horses before breakfast. And then, uh, you know, my big sports growing up because I was really near Glenshee in Perthshire was, uh, was skiing and horse riding. I wasn't really a bike rider until later on. Um, you know, I, I, and there was nothing 
about my parents or my upbringing that was particularly sporty. I was just connected with the great outdoors and involved in, in just being incredibly, incredibly active. So it's not like, you know, I've, I've grown up in a family who, who pushed me into athletics in any way. So your first big journey, Dundee to Oban at the age of 12. Yeah. I mean, I can remember I was doing it at 12 and it wasn't even contemplating something like that. How did that come about? I mean, that was a, 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 a tiny idea which just grew arms and legs. I, 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 um, I read in the local paper. I remember every, you know, I was, I was a, a, a big reader when I was young and um, it was always the Farmer's Weekly, <laughs> uh, the Horse and Hound and uh, the, the Dundee Courier were my sort of uh, staple uh, reading fodder. And I, I read in the, in the local paper, The Courier, about a guy who had cycled from John O'Groats to Land's End and I had no idea how far that was or, or what was involved. But I, I was inspired by it, you know, I, had, I thought that's a great idea. And I went to the farm car, obviously a landy, got, a, got the map out, got a highlighter pen and found the roads from the top of Scotland to the bottom of England and took it to my mum and dad as, as my first um, sort of uh, journey. Um, I think Dad said, "Don't be so daft." My my mum, um, being quite supportive, said, "Well, Mark, why don't you try something smaller first? Because you've not really cycled off the farm before." Um, you know, I was eleven years old at the time, so I recruited a friend, and with both of our our, our dads and mums in the support vehicles, I, I pedalled from Dundee to Oban across Scotland, which was um, 145 miles. Um, took three days, raised some money for some local Scottish charities, and I loved it. It wasn't, it wasn't just the journey, the on the road, but it was, um, you know, I got I got my story in the paper, which was a real buzz as a twelve year old boy, and um, got to meet royalty by 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 raising money um, for some charities which I had a connection with. Actually, that was to do with horse riding, with uh, you know the sport I was passionate about, the ILPH. So it was. Um, yeah, it was a fun start, but it wasn't, the, it wasn't really the sport of it. It was the place the bike took me. It was the fact that I got to cross Scotland under my own power and I got to share the journey. I loved all of that. And then over my teenage years, these, these journeys quite organically just got bigger and bigger. And at age 15, you'd done John O'Groats to Land's End. So, I mean, that again, I remember I was doing it at 15 and it certainly wasn't, you know, going down that road. When you were growing up, did you have hopes and dreams of becoming an adventurer? No, not at all. I mean, uh, I went to high school in Dundee and that was a real culture shock. I was this, you know, homeschooled boy who'd till the age of 12 been in overalls and Wellington boots and my friends were my sisters, really. Um, and then I suddenly was plonked into a school of over a thousand pupils in the concrete jungle and I was wearing a uniform and I was I was just such a goofy kid. I, I didn't have a Scooby, I didn't have a clue what was cool and what wasn't and you know inevitably got picked on uh, quite badly. I had a pretty rough ride for my first few years of high school. There was nothing, you know, it was just that fact that I'd not been in a playground before and there are, it's a tough old environment if you've not sort of grown up with an... Un I'd never been in a social environment where everyone just didn't get on. Um, you know, there was different groups and likes and dislikes. I'd never experienced that. Most kids see that for the first time when they're three, four, five. I got dropped into it at the age of 12, which is quite a culture shock. My point is, I went to a school where the definition of sport was rugby. And I was terrible at rugby, terrible at football. So, you know, lined up in the playground, I was the last to be picked. And, you know, I was, I was awful. I never, never scored a single try, I don't think. So, my, my, I mean, according to my peers at high school, I, was, I wasn't sporty at all. Um, my uh, every weekend and sometimes during the week, I was up Glenshee skiing. I was a you know, passionate skier. I was, I was competing on the, on the horse. Um, you know, I was sporty in my own way, but I never saw myself as athletic because in the eyes of my peers and my, my, my friends as time went on at school, uh, I wasn't sporty at all. It was just something I did. I think the journeys like cycling John O'Groats Land's End was an escape for me. It was every summer holiday getting out and doing something which was mine. You know, it wasn't something I was judged for. It became sort of my thing. The fact that I couldn't score a try didn't matter because, you know, I, I could go out and pedal my bike from one end of the country to the other. But it was never with a view that this would, you know, I didn't know you could make a job out of it. I simply thought, um, you know, let's use my holidays. And, uh, and because I did quite well at school um, I, I was I was I was really pushed into going to university and getting the best degree I could sort of thing so you know I ended up going to, to Glasgow and studying economics and politics and for years gave lip service to the fact I would work in finance and move to London and earn my millions and that's genuinely what I thought until my early 20s. 
so you've you've had this amazing adventure, and although perhaps you couldn't score a try, you've you know travelled the world multiple times. You've seen some amazing places. You've been through a lot of trials and tribulations. What do your parents think of your profession? Because I know that your mum Una is heavily involved. Yeah, I mean, uh, mum's involvement in what I do. I mean, we call sort of mum base camp because that's that's the role she fills brilliantly. I mean. Her capacity to coordinate these projects and then between the expeditions, uh, run my diary, run my logistics is is, is amazing. She's such a, a great people person, a, a negotiator. She can juggle a, a dozen things at once, which I can't. Um, um, my mom and dad split up when I was uh, uh, still at high school. Um, d- Dad's supportive from, of what I do from afar, but he's certainly not involved in any um, any close way. And he, he, my father probably doesn't understand what I do in the same way. I mean, he was definitely quite keen that I, I use my degree and, and get a, a proper career. I mean, I think there was a stage in my in my early 20s, probably into my l- late 20s, that he was really thinking, you know, at what point are you going to stop um, having this uh, extended gap year and, uh, and, and go back and get a proper job, quote unquote. So I totally understand why um, my, my dad felt that way. I, th- I think as time goes on, maybe I've surprised him because, you know, I've made a success out of it, not just in terms of breaking records, but, you know, it's obvious now as a father with kids, with, you know, responsibilities in my, in my mid thirties, um, that, you know, making a success of this doesn't, doesn't mean, you know, forfeiting a career. I've very much made a business and a career out of it. Um, but but Eunice remains absolutely at the heart of what I do, and I couldn't I couldn't do what I do without her. It, to, to the point where we sort of need to remind Yuna that she's also mum and granny, because otherwise we just end up as colleagues the whole time. And I think for my wife, it's uh, it's a constant conversation about let's make sure that that granny can be granny as opposed to just uh, you know somebody who's who's working in the office with you. So you, t- you touched on the idea of economics and history in Glasgow and then perhaps moving on to BSEA. Is that something you, you look back on, you look forward to? Do you think that might be in your future? Um, well, I mean, OK, so I'm, I'm 10 years uh, from graduating and in those 10 years I've travelled to about 130 countries. I've had the opportunity to you know, present numerous uh, documentaries, especially for the BBC. I've written three books, I've national talk tours. I mean, the... the and, and I've built quite a strong business. I mean, I, I feel incredibly lucky for the for the experiences I've had. And, you know, I, I think a lot of careers these days happen in chapters, um, you know, two or three chapters. The idea of a job for life is probably gone for most people. Um, would I ever go back to doing my CA, becoming an accountant and working in finance? I don't think so. Not in a not in a traditional sense. I actually work with quite a lot of corporates uh, in an ongoing way, and I I find that very fulfilling, very interesting. Um, The idea of actually being in the office in London every day, um, having had the you know, the last 10 years, uh, I think I think I'd find very difficult. I quite like plowing my own furrow now. I quite like waking up every year and saying, what are we going to do differently? What what challenge are we going to set ourselves? The risk and reward equation with that is quite incredible. It's exciting. It's, it's you know, it's, it's the unknown. I think it'd be very unnerving if you were used to being uh, the security of, of employment. But um, I very much got used to that and I very much in, in, enjoy that. I mean, there's complete there's massive peaks and troughs in a, in a career like this. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's exciting. But um, yeah, having, having sort of been the master of my own destiny for the last 10 years and, and built a, basically a family business, um, whatever happens after the world cycle this year, uh, I think will evolve off the back of what I've done as opposed to a completely clean slate and, and, and doing something different. Now you test yourself on a regular basis. How do you develop this focus and the self-belief? That's a good question because you can obviously um, train your, your, yourself physically, but the, the, the mental resilience and the belief, the comfort zone to take on bigger and bigger challenges has to come through experience. And I've seen that uh, in difficult situations in the high mountains, in, in the oceans, where you take athletes, gym athletes, um, people who, who, who physically are, are absolutely top of their game. But you take them to a place where they've never been before, under uh, incredible stress, um, be it sleep deprivation or you know risk on life, or a place where they've never been because they're so used to training themselves um, physically uh, only. And that leap 
um, means they, they, they don't cope well. You've got to, over a period of time, um, become accustomed to operating under stress, under duress. I, I think that human beings are quite good at putting themselves through tough stuff um, if they can imagine a time in the near future when that's going to be over. You know, it's why we go out and run 10Ks or marathons or do do events which, you know, really challenge yourselves. It's what I call type two fun, the stuff that's miserable at the time, but this the stuff that's uh, quite miserable at the time, but, you know, we look back on quite fondly. I always think that, you know, when you're sitting in the pint in the, in the pub having a pint, that's type one fun. That's that's in the moment. Yeah, we're having a good a jolly. But when you're in the pub, you're talking about type two fun. You're telling your mates about the time you beat yourself up and did something challenging. And I think that's what becomes the, the real life affirming, uh, career defining stuff. It's what we're all made of. And we love challenging ourselves. But the psychology of it's interesting because as I say, we all like to think of a time in the near future when we're not doing that. So running a marathon, you can you can think, well, in three, four hours, it's going to be over. The difference in my world is there's a never ending this. I've been on four expeditions that last over half a year. When you're out there and you're having a tough day, you can't think, well, tomorrow or next week or next month, it's going to be easier because you're going to be doing exactly the same thing. So you need to find motivation. You need to find happiness um, in what you're doing as opposed to the idea it's going to be over quite soon. So for a lot of performance athletes, that's a real change in mindset. You know, you're not beating yourself up for a for a match for 80, 90 minutes or for a 100 meter sprint. You're in it. You're fully committed. And it's you've got to somehow find that that resolve through what you're doing, as opposed to the idea it's soon to be over. And that becomes very sort of obvious when things go wrong. I mean, when I capsized in the middle of the Atlantic, um, those who performed well, and basically saved the lives of the team were those who had been on big expeditions before. They knew that they would never, uh, they would never uh, assume somebody else would step up and 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 do what was needed. The buck stops with you personally. So that resolve comes through experience. And and you know what? Um, with experience, you you realise that. Um, yeah, your fondest memories are those toughest times. Uh, whilst you don't go looking for it, the stuff which nearly breaks you ultimately uh, defines you. And I know that sounds a bit cliched, but the press always uh, reflect on the really big days on expeditions, the days I'm smashing it out the park. But some of the worst days um, are actually what define the overall success. I mean, the last world record I broke was the length of Africa, Cairo to Cape Town. Zambia, Botswana, South Africa, I was averaging well over 200 miles a day. That makes good headlines. Ethiopia... There was a day there where I covered 80 miles. Broken roads, I had food poisoning, the bike was breaking. It was awful. You'll never find that in the press because it doesn't look very impressive. I put more effort in that day. And if you can't do the 80 days where you're carrying the bike, you're never going to do the 200 mile days where you've got a tailwind and you're cracking along. So it's just the way you see it. And, and the realisation that when you're in those fights that you've got a wry smile, a bit of a fire in the belly and going, right, this is awful, but this is actually why we do it. Well, I think it makes you match fit. If we go back to 2007 when you were crossing the Nullarbor, yeah. and I've crossed the Nullarbor, and I did it in a bus, and I was the, almost hypnotised with the nothingness. Yeah. It's almost like being on a foreign planet. There's a point during the BBC documentary, and for those that haven't watched it, I would say watch it right now, turn off the podcast, watch it. There's a point where you're doing a piece of the camera, and you're talking about how tough it is, and just as it, before it cuts where you sort of put your head down and you have a moment, that's obviously the stuff that strengthens you. Yeah. How do you get through that immediate moment? Do you just buckle under and think about the miles that you've got to put through? Well, I mean, I'd love to say it was superhuman, but the reality is when you normally have those moments where you're breaking, uh, where you, you can't, you don't want to carry on, you've lost that, that, that willpower, those emotions happen in a place where you normally can't give up. You know, when you're sitting in a nice coffee shop, the sun's shining and things are going well, you don't have those emotions. And that's where there's a, 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 an easy exit. When you're 700, 800 miles north of the Arctic Circle pushing a boat through ice fields, when you're 6,500 metres, you know, climbing a, an exposed arete on a mountain, when you're in the middle of the outback in Australia, as you described, those are where you sometimes crack and go, I've, I'm done, I, I want to give up. Do you know what? You can't. You're in a place where you're fully committed. The only thing worse than going slowly is stopping. So your momentum is your greatest friend. 
So I guess the, the wonderfully simple thing about expeditions is, unlike real life, um, when things get incredibly difficult, that, that choice as to whether to carry on or not has basically been taken away. You've, you've put yourself in that position and you need to get yourself out of there. They're normally quite dangerous places to stop. Are you ever worried that you're going to commit to something that maybe will be out of your grasp? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm constantly aware of the the risks involved in in the expeditions. I, I don't think I'm a, a daredevil. I, I I think what I I take on is very calculated. And um, in recent years, now I've got two daughters and I'm married. I, I'm definitely taking on different types of challenges. I'm no longer doing some of the high altitude mountaineering. I'm no longer rowing oceans. I, I I'm trying to push myself harder than ever as an athlete. But um, by the same token, I. I don't think I need to take on the same degree of risk. So, I mean, the, the expedition I've got this year is fully supported as opposed to wild man style. And um, it's not for nearly as long. You know, I'm away for two and a half months, which is in my in my book, a short expedition. So um, I've definitely changed things as time goes on. Some of the some of the, 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 the expeditions I took on in my 20s, um, no regrets, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't do now. I've got, uh, you know, the responsibility of the, the family. I think as well sometimes ignorance is bliss and the idea of going along that journey and then realising, you know, perhaps you need to do it again. Are you quite excited about revisiting your first adventure? Yeah, I mean, going back to retake the circumnavigation world record, which is an 18,000 mile journey, is not something I ever gave serious consideration to until the last two, three years. I mean, I can in that BBC documentary, The Man Who Cycled the World, I say, and I, I, I meant it, I, you know, I'm not going to cycle around the world again. Um, I am excited about going back. It's slightly comparing apples and pears because this time I'm fully supported as opposed to unsupported, which makes it a completely different headspace. And also, um, it's almost an entirely different route, except for the stretch you uh, described, the, the, the Australia and New Zealand bit. So um, I think it will be a completely different experience. What's motivated me to come back is, I mean, after I cycled around the world last time, which at the time I and others considered to be fast, I mean, I went 100 miles a day for half a year, um, the world has moved on very quickly in the last decade, and that record has got faster and faster and faster. What I did in 194 days is now a record of 123 days. And it's it's taken on, you know, greater degrees of support, and it's changed in style, but you know, it ultimately it's the same record and it's the ultimate. It's like sailing, it's like flying, it's the circumnavigation, it's the biggest prize in ultra endurance. So um, there's always been that sort of itch to scratch, that wonder of, right, well, I did that and that was really where I started, but I'm a much stronger bike rider now. I've got a decade more experience. What's the ultimate? You know, all chips on the table, what's possible? How fast can you go? And the only way to do that properly is to get rid of all the other variables, you know, Where's my? Where am I going to sleep tonight? Where's my next meal? Where, where am I going to find clean water? If you've taken care of all that, as an athlete, how fast can you go? And that's when you can create another really quite significant leap in performance. And are you looking forward to having company? Because you must get incredibly lonely when you're doing the, you know, the wild man style. I mean, people ask that all the time. People say, do you get bored and do you get lonely? And the answer is no. I mean, it's hard to describe, but it's a completely different headspace when you're on expeditions. Um, you know that old cliche, you can be alone, but not lonely. You know, I've, I've been, I've been, I've been lonely on the London underground, but I've never been lonely in a desert. Um, so it's not to do with the amount of people around you, but it's about, you know, how, how connected your senses are, how interested you are, how, um, you know, how fulfilled you are. If you're, if you're challenging yourself, I, I'd be a rubbish nomadic traveler. If you said, right, you've got two years on your bicycle, go off and pedal around the world, I'd get bored, I'd get lonely. I mean, I've got the utmost respect for, you know, the Al Humphreys and the Rob Lilwells and all these guys who nomadically travel. I, I couldn't do it. You know, I'm somebody who, who travels with a real purpose. It's always first or fastest or I'm really chasing time. Having said that, I've never I've never entered a competitive race, but I've, all, I've always been in a, a hurry. So I think that distracts me from any loneliness. And I'm, I'm always, you know, I'm, all, I'm always sort of very focused on, on the journey. So... Yes, I'm looking forward to going back with a full support team, but I mean, I'm riding 16 hours a day. I'm riding four times four hour sets, sleeping only five hours a night. So I'm in, I'm in an absolutely sort of blinkered racing state. It's not particularly sociable, even though I've got a support team with me. I mean, I am, when I get off the bike, I talk to my mechanic, my performance manager, 
and all the other people kind of take care of themselves. And it's just go, 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 go. I mean, I've just completed a two week training ride around Britain, which was what, 3,300 miles in a fortnight. And um, yeah, it's, it's such a strange mindset to describe. You know, you're, the alarm goes off at half three, you're on the bike at four, you're on the go till half nine at night, you get into bed about half 10, the alarm goes off at half past three, you're back on the bike. It's relentless, it's absolutely brutal. One of the previous guests in the show was Levin Brown. Yeah. And he was talking, you know, it's two hours of rowing and then it's two hours of whether you're resting, yeah. whether you're repairing the boat, you're getting back. Do you find your discipline has changed since you've tried so many different disciplines? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely good at sort of self-motivating and cracking on. It's interesting, Levin Brown's part of my support team. He's one of my team leaders on the, on the Round the World Cycle. He's taking care of um, the Australian New Zealand leg. So, I, I mean, I know Levin very well and he's a, he's a friend for, for many years. And I've also done that two hours on, two hours off ocean rowing. And it's, it's tough, tough, tough. But um, you do get to switch off every two hours on a rowing boat, boat. Whereas on a cycling expedition like this, it's 16 hours on the go. And then you've got five hours off. So it's, there's something absolutely unrelenting about that. Um, I would say ocean rowing's tougher because, uh, you know, your, your, your hands and your, your backside and the, the salt sores and all that side of things. But the fact you get to switch off every two hours is something you can think your way through. The duration of a 16 hour block is, is brutal. You know, when you get on the bike at four in the morning and you know that you're going to be going till gone nine o'clock that night, it's, um, it's, it's got an intensity to it, which is, I would, I would say even tougher. You've inspired thousands of people around the world to perhaps push through goals, reach different ones. Who is it that inspires you or who do you look to? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I've worked with some wonderful mentors, so I'm probably not going to pick out famous people here. Um, I worked with a wonderful, uh, a great late friend, David Pete, who is um, a, a, a photographer and filmmaker, director. Um, and he, he was the guy who inspired me to take the journeys I was doing and share them with an audience. He turned it from, you know, uh, a personal journeys to something which you could really create impact. His passion was capturing real life in screen time and in imagery and, 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 and capture, capturing the emotion of these journeys. And I've been very lucky over the years to build what I call this virtual peloton, this, this global audience who follow the journeys. And, and it's a wonderful, positive feedback loop. I mean, you might think, well, that's great. It's inspiring and helping people, but it really adds fuel to my fire in terms of keeping going on the road as well. But, you know, I worked with David for five years at the start of my career, and he taught me most of what I know about broadcast. And, um, and, and it's somebody who I, who I remember very fondly because I mean, he, he said, you know, I'm sort of passing the baton on to you. And this is incredible legacy of work from the 60s um, as to sort of, you know, capture the humanity and, and the, the people and the places and the culture and the, and the landscapes. And that's that's become a huge part of what I do. So there's a few characters like David, like Yuna, my mum, who have just shown incredible, quiet leadership and a real passion for what they do. And, uh, you know, I, I take huge, stre huge strength from them. What are you scared of? Uh, I guess I'm. Uh, what am I scared of? I've I've got uh, in, in 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 specific terms. I'm very you know even though I'm a a, a climber of sorts. I I'm 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 pretty pretty scared. The right word. I've got a very healthy respect for for heights and 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 significant drops. Um, I'm not very good on ex in exposed sections. Having said that, I've climbed you know a number of six out of seven thousand meter mountains. I can do it mind over matter, but it's not it's not my favourite place when I'm hanging off the side of a mountain and I'm looking at a three thousand meter drop. Um, what drives me on in an expedition is the fear of failure, and that's much bigger. You know, people talk about positive motivation. You know, what do you look forward to? What sees you through? Well, actually, if I was to talk about my toughest day on expedition, I'm not giving myself some cheesy inspirational quote. I'm constantly repeating the consequences for failure. Uh, so it doesn't sound particularly positive, but um, the it's the carrot and the stick. And, you know, when when the going gets really tough, it's definitely the stick that keeps me going. You know, it's not the it's not the prize at the end of the road. It's the consequences from failing. These are professional expeditions. They cost a lot. There's a lot of people, you know, got high expectations of what I do, um, not least of all myself. So, um, you know, I don't let myself uh, consider uh, stopping and failing. 
And if I couldn't finish an expedition because of injury or illness or whatnot, that's fair enough. But I never ever want to come back and think, well, what if, you know, I uh, could have trained better or planned better or anything like that. So that's, that's probably my greatest fear. Who or what do you think of when you hear the word success? Uh, success, I mean, oh, who, who do I think of? My goodness. I mean, I'd say I've had some amazing positive influences in my life and some very negative ones as well. But I think, you know, the, t- the tough times, you know, maybe maybe school and some early years ultimately g- gives you a lot of the resolve that, that makes you, you know, who you are. Success for me, as a thing, not a person, success is... Um, uh, it doesn't matter whether you work for the world's largest corporation or work for yourself. It's it's, it's being happy in what you do. It's, it's being fulfilled in what you do. It's that excitement from feeling like what you're doing is worthwhile. Whenever I've got a, you know, a difficult crossroads and I wonder if I'm making the right decision, it could be financial, it could be family, it could be to do with an expedition. I try and pause and have a conversation with my 70 year old self. And normally a bit of perspective like that allows you to make the quite often the tougher decision, but the decision which ultimately is, is going to have the most impact long term. Because the easy decision, the quick decision, is often what makes you feel good in the moment. But it's not ultimately what's going to be, you know, that, um, what's not, not, it's not what's going to define your career. You know, it's that classic, you know, I could have a bit of fast food and I'd feel great for five minutes or, or I could eat right. And that's going to, you know, that's going to help me perform long term. You know, if you're about to buy the fast food and you have a conversation with your 70 year old self, that he's going to say, no, don't bother. Uh, and even though that's the quick fix and the easy, the easy solution, it's not ultimately what sort of what builds up to be the important stuff in life, you know, health and well-being and time with family. So, um, yeah, success, success for me is very much being in um, being in charge of your own destiny. I, 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 and, and that, you know, whether you're. I say whether you're, it doesn't matter, you know, work or or, or personally, whether you're, um, whether you're, um, you know, actually running your own show or, or 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 doing something with a much larger group. It doesn't it doesn't actually matter. It just means that the buck stops with you. You're in the driving seat, uh, and you're, you're you're passionate about what you do. The amount of young people I meet who have these great ideas and this great passion, but then what they're actually doing with their life is something entirely different. Um, and, and, my, and I spend a lot of my time out with my work. You know, I'm the rector at uh, the University of Dundee. I'm the, the, the patron for the Saltire Foundation. I, I try and um, use my time out with sort of my core work w- with that age group where it's about making real choices. Um, you know, education is fantastic, but education is nothing if you don't then stop and actually have a real think about what you want to do with it. If you just get fast-tracked into something that your parents or your peers expect you to do, you know, it's it's worthless. It's not going to help you or, or the world we live in in the long term. So, so that that word choice uh, is really at the heart of what success is. Final question: If somebody's struggling in life, because you've went through struggles, and by that I mean you've conquered some real mountains, what advice would you give to somebody that is struggling in life at the moment? It's incredibly difficult when you're in a dark place, when you're having a difficult time to take advice from anyone, um, but. I and mean, it's that word perspective. And the only way to do that is to try and take, you out, take yourself out of the situation and, um, and try and start to make choices for yourself. If you're not making choices for yourself, it's very, very difficult to be a master of your own destiny. So, you, you know, it's about control. You know, as, as people sort of grow up, they sort of look up to their parents, look up to their peers. But there's going to become that tipping point where you say, right, OK, I'm in charge. This is my show. And if you become a 30-year-old, 40-year-old, 50-year-old, and you're still not really, you know, you're still looking to others to call the shots. Uh, that's very, very difficult. Um, so, you know, if people are having difficult time, often it's because you know they they feel like they've handed over or don't have that don't have that control. Um, so it's never it's never a simple solution. And my goodness, uh, I've not made it. You know, it's not like it's not like over the last decade, despite the you know the career I've had, it's not like I feel like I fixed it. I am. Um, you know, I go through the same sort of stresses and 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 worries and uh, pressures as 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 absolutely anyone. And I think that that hunger sort of um, keeps you going. You never stop and you go right. I'm done. Um, you know, there's always that sense of right. Well, I've done that. So what's next? Uh, and that keeps it exciting. Mark Bowman, thank you for being a guest on the Stephen Rowan Show. Thank you very much.
Rose Show. It's Stephen Rose. Stephen Rose. Stephen Rose. Stephen Rose. Bringing you entertaining and inspiring guests.